A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Lusa. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, Yehuda Gabriel. Yehuda Gabriel with Jewish History Soundbites, and this episode about the Beis Halevi has been sponsored by the Worldwide Friends of Brisk Association in honor of the founder of the dynasty, the Beis Halevi, and requesting of everyone to think of two ways to listen to this episode. Either listen to the episode or have the episode play in your ears. It's always fun to explore the history of Jewish aristocracy, and there's none more exciting than the Soloveitchik dynasty, and the Beis Halevi is generally seen as the founder of this uh, dynasty, of Yosef Dov Halevi Soloveitchik, the rabbi in Brisk at the end of the 19th century, although the prominence of the family precedes him by several generations, but he was the first really famous, world-renowned Soloveitchik, uh, world-renowned and world-respected Torah leader, he was also the first one to serve as the rabbi of Brisk, so he brings together the name Soloveitchik with the city of Brisk. In fact, his biography in Hebrew uh, is Harishain Lesheishelis Brisk. That's the name of the, the title of the book. The Harishain, the first one of Sheishelis Brisk, of the uh, the Brisk dynasty. And it's by a fellow by the name of Reb Chaim Karlinsky, who was an interesting character in his own right. He studied in the Slabatki Yeshiva, then he moved with it to Hebron, then he was a student of Rav Kook, and then he moved to the United States, he was involved in the Yagodah Sarabonim, he moved back to Israel, and he was involved with the Mizrahi, and then he moved back to the United States. But one of the main accomplishments of this Reb Chaim Karlinsky was this book that he wrote, Harishain Le Sheisheles Brisk, about the, the Beis HaLevi, um, and the fact that it was... It was a great biography, and it was written in the early 1980s, before the whole genre of uh, rabbinical biographies, and he preceded it by quite a few years. Um, and the, so the Beis Halevi is one of the early ones that there actually was a nice biography written about, um, and uh, I don't think there's been anything substantial written about him since then, so we need like a remake or a translation into English or something of the sort. So unlike his famous uh, sons and other descendants, his biography was written quite uh, quite early on, relatively early on. As we'll see, the Beis Halevi had a very interesting life story and family story, and I'll just mention at the outset that his son from his third marriage, Rip Simcha Soloveitchik, the youngest son, there was a boy and girl from his third marriage, Pesha was the daughter. So this, his son, his youngest, his Ben Zakunim, uh, who was, I think he was born when the Beis Halevi was quite old, like 59 or quite old. Um, so Reb Simcha Soloveitchik is featured in this coming week's Mishpacha magazine in the For the Record column by Davi Safir and myself. And this Reb Simcha Soloveitchik, the son of the Beis Halevi, was one of the more forgotten figures of the Soloveitchik dynasty. Reb Simcha was born to the Beis Halevi later on in his life, to his third wife, like I said. So he makes him a half-brother of Reb Chaim Brisker. He was a rabbi in Mogilev in, in, in Russia, and then he later moved to the United States. So he's the first major uh, Brisker, son of the Beis Halevi, to move to the United States. He was a rabbi in Brooklyn um, at the Brisk Shul, uh, I guess not ironically. 
Um, so he, he's an interesting story, and you'll want to check that out. And he's profiled in this week's Mishpacha magazine, so make sure to pick up your copy so you can read all about Reb Simcha Soloveitchik. But we're going to focus now on his father. And today, the city of Brisk is in Belarus, near the Polish border. And I've been there with groups several times. Uh, even though there's really nothing to see in Brisk, the shul is gone, the yeshiva building's gone, the homes of, of the Beis Halevi, or Chaim Brisk, or the Brisk Rav, are gone. Even the cemetery is destroyed. There's almost nothing to see. The only thing to actually see there, uh, funnily enough, is a large statue of the only Brisk native to have won a Nobel Prize, and that's, of course, Menachem Begin. But either way, the old cemetery is partly a parking lot today, and there's a pretty uh, uh, good tradition uh, regarding, the reliable tradition, regarding the spot in that parking lot, which is the spot where the Beis Halevi is buried, where it, when it once was the cemetery. So we've gone to this parking lot with groups a few times and paid our respects at the spot in the parking lot where the Beis Halevi's final resting place is. It's kind of sad. Uh, and tragic in a way, and I really hope that the situation is rectified sometime soon that we can actually go to the Beis Halevi's kever. So the Beis Halevi is known, um, he's, again, he's Rebeis of Dov Halevi Soloveitchik, but everyone calls him the Beis Halevi because he's known by the book he authored, Halachic Response, several volumes. He wrote quite a few others for him as well, um, and he named it the Beis Halevi, and he himself published it in three stages um, all by him in his own lifetime, which was, you know, unique and also very different than his descendants, who, for the, for the most part, left their writings in manuscript, and it was posthumously published by their children and descendants and students. Whereas the Beis Halevi, you know, organized it, wrote it, and published it himself. He also had uh, several prominent descendants who were named for him, Rabbi Yosef Dave including Rav Soloveitchik of YU in Boston, and, um, and including Rav Beryl Soloveitchik in Brisk in Yerushalayim, uh, among others. There are several prominent Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik's named for the patriarch of the family. So he himself is named for his paternal grandfather, Rav Yosef Soloveitchik, who was a rabbi in Kovna. Um, his grandmother, um, or the Beis Halevi's grandmother, was Relka, the daughter of Reb Chaim Velazhener, making the Beis Halevi a great-grandson of Reb Chaim Velazhener. The Beis Halevi's father was Reb Yitzchak Zev Salavechik, and he had studied in Velazhen during the time of Reb Itzela Velazhener, who was obviously his uncle. And for a time, uh, he served in some sort of capacity in the yeshiva. Uh, later on, this Reb Yitzchak Zev was a prominent communal leader and even an official Rav Mitam, again, a Tsarist-recognized uh, rabbi, a crown rabbi in Kovna, which is interesting that the Soloveitchiks had that as well. And the Beis Halevi's mother, Rivka, was from a Hasidic family, Lechavich Hasidim. Lechavich is the antecedents of the Slanim dynasty. So his mother was Hasidic, and his father was, of course, a grandson of Reb Chaim So it's an interesting shidduch. And I just want to point out an interesting note on Hasidim in the world of the Beis Halevi. Though the Beis Halevi and his ancestors and descendants are all seen as misnagdim, opponents of Hasidim, they're descendants of Reb Chaim Velazhner. As I mentioned, the Beis Halevi's mother came from a Hasidic family. The first wife of the Beis Halevi was from a Chabad Hasidic family. The second wife of the Beis Halevi was from a Lechavich Hasidic family, similar to his mother. And the third wife of the Beis Halevi was from Warsaw. So I'm not sure if she was from a Hasidic family uh, or not, but if she's from Warsaw, then it's almost, by nature of being from Warsaw, it almost makes you Hasidic. So how do we explain this phenomenon um, of, of this combination? We don't have to explain it because we let great scholars like Professor Marcin Wojcinski explain it instead. And what he said was that unlike conventional wisdom would have it, Hasidim and non-Hasidim rarely refrained from intermarrying. It's uh, somewhat of a myth. Uh, they intermarried regularly, and they didn't have any issue with it. And this was for two reasons. Number one, women were rarely, if ever, viewed as Hasidois, as, as active Hasidim in a court. Rather, they were known as coming from a Hasidic family, a daughter of a Hasid, a 
sister of a chassid, a wife of a chassid, which is a whole topic in its own merit, which I'm not going to get into now. Why was that the case? And did, did it hold true throughout the history of the Hasidic movement or only through the 19th century? That's for another time. But that's the reality. And therefore, um, there was no issue with intermarriage uh, fundamentally. And number two, what mattered in a shidduch in Eastern Europe through the 19th century was three criteria, wealth, yichus, and Torah or rabbinic credentials. Those are the only three things that mattered in the important families. And uh, therefore, that, that, you know, if, if they had wealth or yichus or Torah, rabbinic scholars, and things like that, or even two of the three, or possibly even one of the three, if there was enough wealth, then you didn't care if they came from a Hasidic family or not. You had the important criteria, and that's what you went with. So the, the, there, there wasn't really an issue of, of uh, intermarriage between Hasidim and non-Hasidim. In this way, the Soloveitchiks, Reb Chaim Brisker, the Briskerov, and the, all the other ones, have plenty of Hasidic yichas in their supposedly pure Litvish pedigree. It's, uh, you know, it has plenty of Hasidus there as well, um, which is probably why they became so great. I'm just kidding around. Born, so the Beis Halevi is born in 1820, he passed away in 1892, um, and he, so he most of the 19th century. He came as a child to Valazhin, well before his bar mitzvah, and he studied there for several years. Remember, he's a family member uh, of the of the Valazhin family, and an overlooked short period of his life, not so short, it was actually for several years, is, is when he went to Minsk um, as a young man in his 20s. Um, Reb Gershon Tancham of Minsk was a leading rabbi, Rosh Hashiva, and Posek in the 19th century, and he headed the prestigious Blumka's Kloy's Yeshiva in Minsk. A very famous yeshiva, which is a story for another time as well. Um, at some point in the 1840s, Reb Gershon Tancham had a ex- reason to have an extended stay in Germany. He was seeking medical tra- treatment for an ailment, and the young Reb of Doiv Soloveitchik was invited to deliver shiurim in, in Blumke's Kloys in Minsk in his stead. So he moved to Minsk for several years. He then returned to Belazhin, uh, and he served as an assistant Rosh Hashiva to his cousin, the Netziv, from Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin of Belazhin. Um, the, the, and this is in 1853, he arrives back, and he becomes the assistant Rosh Hashiva. There was a lot of controversy then. Who's going to be the assistant Rosh Hashiva? Is the Netziv the one in charge? Does he have an assistant? Who's that assistant going to be? Rabbi Shua Hash 11 um, was pushed to the side at this point, or the Beis Halevi comes in. I discussed this whole dispute and this whole saga at length, in depth, uh, uh, on the series that I did quite some time ago, a couple of years ago, on the Velazhin Yeshiva. It was a whole dispute which eventually led to the Beis Halevi's departure from Velazhin several years later. You may want to check out that episode. It was, um, I would guess, number two or three um, on the Velazhin series, but I may be wrong, maybe it was four, I don't remember. Um, it was one of the uh, parts in the Velazhin series. Very interesting story. I'll go through it um, just, um, you know, very quickly here as well, but um, but you'll, ha- you'll have to go back to hear it more in depth on that Velazhin series. In the interim, before I get to the whole Velazhin story, in the interim, the Beis Levi had gotten married, and he had a daughter uh, from that first marriage, and then he got divorced. Um, he's, the marriage did not work out. A second marriage was shortly afterwards to Rebetzin Cyril Efron from Velazhin, but she, even though she grew up in Velazhin, she was from a Hasidic Lechavich family, like I mentioned. Most of the Beis Levi's children were from this marriage, including Reb Chaim Brisker, Reb Chaim Brisker actually had an, uh, an older brother. The oldest son of the Beis Halevi from the second marriage was Reb Avram Barach Soloveitchik. And uh, he was a rabbi in Smolensk in Russia for 30 years, from 1883 till his passing in 1913. The reason that's noteworthy is that Smolensk is outside the Pale of Settlement. And the Jewish communities outside the Pale were quite unique because you officially were not allowed to live outside the Pale. So who lived outside the Pale? People who had money. Uh, people who were more educated, people in the professions, certain types of finishing military service, um, long time in the Russian army by the czars, uh, wealthy, uh, more secular, some even assimilated. Those were the type of communities outside of the pale. And here, the Beis Halevi's oldest son was the rabbi there for quite some time. And that's got to be an interesting story as well. Either way, the Serbavram Baruch had a son, Rabbi Srol Soloveitchik, and he was 
later a rabbi in Johannesburg in South Africa. The Beis Levi had a bunch of other kids from this uh, second wife, uh, another daughter named Relka, for his grandmother, Chaim and his daughter, obviously. She married a fellow who was a rabbi in Yassi in Romania. So these Soloveitchiks really got around and very, very far from brisk. So, as I mentioned, the, the, the base slave is a Rosh Hashiv in from 1853 and on, when he returned from Minsk, and he clashes with the Nitziv in pretty much every area, in learning style, and the way they delivered Shiurim, and the way they related to the students, in policy of the Yeshiv, in administration, in acceptance of new students, in funding, in budgeting, in salaries, and control of the whole institution. Pretty much about everything. So some students liked uh, the Nitziv's old style method of study, which was more of a Bikiyas Pshat style, while many others enjoyed the Beis Halevi's sharp and incisive, in-depth uh, style of learning. So things came to a head in the mid-1850s, uh, and a rabbinical arbitration committee, I guess we could call it, because they went out of their way to say it's not a Besdin. They did not have an odd number of rabbis. They had an even number, and they made it that it's a arbitration, borerut, uh, you know, to borer, uh, arbitration, basically. And they're convened in Velazhin to decide who would be in, in charge. It was in 1856. There were four rabbis invited to oversee the proceedings. A relatively young Rebitzik Khan inspector, who did not study in Valajan, but he was already well respected even before he was the rabbi in Kavanah. He's still the rabbi in Navardic at this time. Two senior living students of Reb Chaim Valajaner, that's Reb David Tevel of Minsk, the Nachos David, and Reb Yassel of Famer, Reb Yassel of Slutsker, who's obviously the rabbi in Slutsk, and the Vilna Magad Reb Zalman Zev. Although the arbitration document, which we have the text of till today, delineated each one's respective position, control, power, and even salary down to the smallest details, uh, Rebbe Yisif Daiv was granted much more control than when he arrived in 1853 um, regarding acceptance policy, uh, spending the yeshiva's money, and of course the salary that he received. So although the Nitziv still had the upper hand, but the Belay Salevi came out of the arbitration with a much more improved position and relatively much more control. So he came out the winner, even though the Nitziv was still the main Rosh Hashiva. However, despite the fact that he came out the winner, the Belay Salevi still was not satisfied with the arrangement. And about eight years later, in 1864, he left Valazhin for good to assume the rabbinate in Slutsk. Um, it isn't clear what the catalyst was for his exit at that time, but it seems that in general he was not satisfied with the Velazhin arrangement and he was not able to see eye to eye with the Nitziv on regarding policy, though, though, though the two of them got along on a personal level. Talking about great people that managed to uh, dispute regarding policy, but still managed to get along, um, which is a historical noteworthy because it's so rare. Um, so there's, there's also actually a story that I, it's, it's very often repeated, quite famous story, an anecdote regarding the difference in personality between the Nitziv and the Beis HaLevi. I call it a tale of two satyrs um, about a student in Valazhin who spent the first seder of Pesach at uh, the Nitziv's home, and the second night he spent it at the Beis HaLevi's home. And he described the two reactions, the two different styles of personalities, two different personalities. Uh, the Nitziv, he said he it was this really calm and very relaxed Seder, great atmosphere, good vibes, good energy, good environment. The matzahs were these big, beautiful white matzahs. And the Nitziv was just so happy and so excited to do the Seder and to, and to have gone through it and how, look at these beautiful matzahs, we're going to get the mitzvah of eating matzah and so on. And he described it with a lot more color and detail, this student in his memoir, I forget who it was. The second night, he went to the Beis HaLevi, and the Beis HaLevi, real brisker, even though this is before he was Rashiva and brisk, he was very intense, and he was very concerned the whole time that perhaps the matzahs aren't good, and there was these, like, you know, thin, black, burnt matzahs, it meant to make sure they're very, very kosher, and and the whole time they're rushing, maybe we're not going to make the zman, chatzais, and whatever, and, and it was very intense, very, very tense, very... Uh, the, the year, he said the Yeres Shemaim of the 
the, the Beis HaLevi was palpable. You felt that he was living, living the fear of God on his face and his entire, uh, permeated his whole uh, uh, existence and the atmosphere by the Seder. So it's two, two different approaches, both legitimate. I remember when I was discussing this story once with my Rebbe in the mirror, Bashar Ariely. So he said, look, they're two different styles. They're both... Uh, you know, both legitimate ways of serving Hashem. He said, you know, as a typical mirror, <laughs> Rav Asher said, personally, I prefer the Nitziv's style, but that's just him, you know. Um, that's that's the mirror for you. Either way, that's the, that's the, that, that was that in Velazhin. So now, the Beis Alevi moves to Slutsk. It's a large and prestigious and ancient Jewish town with some famous rabbis. The Beis Alevi himself was succeeding the aforementioned Rabbi Yassila Slutsker. Uh, Russell Famer, who had recently passed away and remained there, and and and, and the Beis Levi remains there for eleven years until the year eighteen seventy five. Why did the Beis Levi leave in eighteen seventy five? He didn't exactly get along with the Kahal leadership, the wealthy establishment. Uh, the Beis Levi was um, a strong leader, strong personality. He cared for the poor of the town. He was the, you know, he stood up for the the, the weak and the downtrodden, very much like his son later on, Reb Chaim Brisker, their style of leadership. And he spoke his mind and his convictions, and he was not afraid to voice his opinion when he per- perceived wrongdoing, when he perceived corruption and the like. And he had, you know, amazing integrity and 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 uh, and truthfulness. And he would not, uh, you know, shy away from confrontation with the Kahal establishment and leadership, who were the ones who paid his salary, obviously. And they showed him the door when, uh, and and he was willing to give up his job, basically, uh, when uh, when uh, when when things clashed and he felt that uh, that you know he was he would have to compromise on his values. So that's why he left Slutsk. It's unclear exactly what it was. What the dispute was, but it isn't difficult to imagine that there were going to be flashpoints and, and conflict. One of the sources I saw actually said that he protested the custom of the choppers who were hired by the Kahal to kidnap poor orphan children for the draft during the terrible Cantonist decrees to the Tsarist uh, Russian army. And unafraid of, of uh, the Kahal, he protested against this practice and the leadership, Kahal leadership, drove him out of town. This is a fascinating version of the events because the Cantonist decrees ended 20 years before that. There were no Cantonist decrees in 1875. They ended in 1855. So it would be an amazing story that 20 years after the Cantonist decrees ended, he was protesting a long abandoned practice. Practice. So other than this minor detail, it would be a great story to repeat about the Beis Halevi. So, so why not, you know? In any event, in 1875, he officially retired from the rabbinate, and he moves to Warsaw. He was assisted during this time in Warsaw by the by a young man named Rabitcha Grzynski, who was transforming Warsaw religious life. He was building schools, he was building yeshivas, he was an incredible activist and leader of Warsaw Jewry for half a century. And he was close with many of the leaders of his day, many of the Torah leaders of his day, the Chavetz Chaim as well, who published his Mr. Brew in Warsaw, and Rabitcha Grzynski assisted him with that. Either way, so he was, Mr. Rabitcha Grzynski was very close to Beis Levi during his time in Warsaw and helped him out a lot. Uh, Rabitcha was quite well known. We go to his kever, actually, in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery. Later on, his son, Rabbi Avram Grzynski, was the mashkiach in Slabatka, and he was killed by the Nazis. Allegedly, during um, the Beis Levi's time in Warsaw, he also had a relationship with the Sfas Emes, uh, the Ger Rebbe. It's definitely possible. I'm not 100% sure. Um... And four years later, in 1879, the Beis Halevi is forced out of retirement, and he reluctantly assumes the rabbinate in Brisk. The Brisk community invited him, they rather implored him, to come to fill the void left by the sudden departure of Ibishu Aleb Diskin, who had to leave uh, because of a whole incident, a whole story in its own merit. And Ibishu Aleb Diskin moves at that time to the land of Israel, which was Ottoman Palestine at the time, and Ibishu Aleb Diskin becomes a prominent in the old Yishuv in Yerushalayim. That's also a great story. So um, the Beis Levi is invited to succeed him in the rabbinate in Brisk. Initially, the Beis Levi turned it down as he was officially done with the rabbinate. But he was told that the Jewish community of Brisk, every individual Jew there, the community as a whole, are all waiting for him in great anticipation. So in deference to them, waiting eagerly for him, he acquiesced and returned to the rabbinate, although he was reluctant to do so. 
He thereby created a dynasty associated with his family name and an eternal association of the Soloveitchik family with the city of Brisk. He served in Brisk until his passing in 1892, and his passing was shortly after the closing of the Velazhin Yeshiva. And his son, Reb Chaim Brisker, who was the assistant to Rosh Yeshiva to the Nitziv at the time of the closing, uh, the Tsarist government expelled the uh, Nitziv and Reb Chaim and the entire faculty from the whole Vilna district. The, the Russian authorities wanted them out. So Reb Chaim had come to live by his father just a few months before. So he was kind of at the right place at the right time and was able to succeed his father in the brisk uh, rabbinate. Another episode from his early years is actually quite interesting, um, from his way early years, from when he was in his 20s. It seems that the Reza Levi had either an interaction or even a an extended relationship with the great Galician Torah scholar and Paisik Reb Shleima Kluger, one of the most prominent rabbis in the world at the time, when the Reza Levi was a young man and Reb Shleima Kluger was already a world-renowned uh, leader, Torah leader. It's, it, it sounds odd. Why? Because not only is Galicia very far from Volozhin and Minsk and far from the world of Volozhin and Minsk, where the base of Levi resided at the time, but Brod, Brody in Galicia, where the Shlomo Kluger was a rabbi, it was in a different country. It was a different empire. It was not Russia. It was the Habsburg Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, but it seems that they, they knew each other. It seems that they definitely knew each other and they interacted and that the elder Reb Shleim Kluger held his younger contemporary in high esteem. One version I saw has it that over the course of the Beis Halevi's divorce that I mentioned, a question arose regarding the spelling of his name, which was Yasha Ber, Reb Yasha Ber So do you spell Yasha with a Shin or a Samach? And the Beis Halevi decided on his own initiative and expense to travel down to Galicia and present this question to Reb Shleim Kluger in person. The latter then invited him to stay for Shabbos and even had him deliver a speech in the shul in Brody. So that would be one version of how they got to know each other. The Beis Levi is also quite heavily involved in the at the macro level of rabbinic leadership, uh, confronting the challenges facing Russian Jewry, which there were many of those over the course of the 19th century. Uh, and the Beis Levi was involved at almost every stage. He was a very prominent on the rabbinic scene across Russia, the crushing oppression of the czars on one hand and meeting with government officials and the trends of modernity, on the other hand, and change. Um, he foreshadowed the involvement of his descendants, the brisker, Soloveitchik approach of charisma, integrity, forcefulness, no compromising, wisdom, sharpness, and sometimes even extremism. So he he's definitely the, the father of the dynasty in many ways, um, in leadership and in his style. And in this context, he participated in many rabbinical gatherings and meetings with government officials and other Jewish leadership, emerging new types of Jewish leadership at that time, and uh, enjoyed that uh, successful rabbinical career um, in, in, in all the places that he was. So this was the Beis Halevi. This is Yehudi Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at yehudi.yehudigeber.com. For questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures, you can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on Podbean or your favorite podcast platform, and I hope you enjoyed.